So welcome, everybody. This is the Milbank Tweed Forum. I am Barry Friedman, uh, and I am very excited about the group that we have uh, together today, and I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation. I'm going to introduce folks very briefly. Uh, obviously, what they've all been doing has been in the news, and then I'm going to start to throw questions at the panel. We will talk, as is usual, for a half an hour or so up front, and then we're very anxious to have your questions, and so we hope that you have them for us. Uh, to my right is Mark Levin. So Mark is the uh, director of Right on Crime. And uh, Right on Crime is a conservative organization that Mark was actually telling us some of the history of yesterday, and I'm going to invite him to do a brief version of that. Today, they really have been at the forefront of uh, leading the conservative movement toward many issues. Maybe the most noticeable is reducing incarceration and have done some really, really remarkable work. To my far left is Brittany Packnett. Brittany Packnett, uh, by day, I think runs Teach for America in St. Louis, but by all every other crack of her life, as best as I can <laughs> tell, uh, ever since Ferguson has been um, an organizer, an organizer of Black Lives Matter. She's one of the founders of um, the Campaign Zero website, which I commend to all of you as an agenda for criminal justice reform. Uh, and she's working with me on uh, the American Law Institute project on principles of police investigations, and we're thrilled to have her. And then to my immediate left, who I just met, is Wesley Lowry. Wesley writes for the Washington Post. Uh, he's prolific on social media, and I have been following all of his work since Ferguson, and it's been terrific. He was arrested in Ferguson, and, and uh, I actually don't know the outcome of that, so maybe he will tell us. Uh, well, we if you want to, to join the legal team. You're more than welcome. <laughs> You're, you're here, so I guess at the moment, at least, things are, are okay. Um, I'm uh, a professor here, obviously, but I'm also the director of a policing project, which we have begun at the law school roughly uh, a year ago, and uh, we're very active in this space, and I'm thrilled to have this group to talk about criminal justice reform. I told Mark that I would start with Mark because you might know less about right on crime than everything else, and so Mark's going to give us a two-minute background on what Right on Crime does, much of which does not involve policing, and then we'll segue to policing. So, Mark? Oh, well, thanks, Barry, and it's great to be here, and I've already had a chance to meet with Barry and many of his students are doing phenomenal work on promoting public engagement and policing practices and kind of shining a light of transparency and accountability, which I think are things people can agree upon regardless of where they are on the political spectrum. Um, but uh, I've been working on criminal justice reform since 2005 when I came on to start uh, uh, the Center for Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and TPPF is the free market think tank in Texas. Uh, and so uh, it was in 2005 when we got into criminal justice, really, uh, we were virtually the only people on the right uh, doing that. And frankly, I think it's a measure of some success that now we have quite a bit of company. Um, but what we set out to do was really uh, fill a void, I think, because uh, almost all the groups working on criminal justice reform have been from the left side of the spectrum, and certainly we share many of the same goals. Um, but, um, you know, going back to things like Willie Horton, um, as Barry and I discussed, the public, uh, many parts of the public at least, uh, I, I kind of trust conservatives more on the issue, rightly or wrongly. Um, and so, um, particularly from the standpoint of personal responsibility, and I think there's perhaps a caricature on, on both sides of the spectrum. I mean, the, the caricature of the right is lock everyone up, throw away the keys, do the crime, do the time. Actually, Ken Cuccinelli, the former Virginia Attorney General, is one of our signatories, calls it the Fry the Litterbugs Caucus. And we do still seem encounter some of those people in various legislative bodies. Um, but no penalty can be too stiff for some. But then on the caricature of the left is, you know, society causes crime, not individuals, right? And everyone just needs to be uh, coddled. And so somewhere in between there, um, one needs to look at what do you act, where do you actually get the best public safety results for every dollar you spend? And how do you actually get restitution to victims? How do you get people free of addiction and all of that? And so that's really where we come in. And uh, for conservatives, it's not just about saving money, but it's also about uh, redeeming lives, certainly redemption, particularly among uh, evangelists evangelicals who are part of this uh, is a very strong motivator. Um, but I think also keeping families together. Uh, incarceration breaks up uh, families uh, every day. And of course, uh, sometimes that's necessary because
because someone is such a danger to the public that they have to be separated from society. But certainly we should, uh, if you take from medicine the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And I'm afraid our correction system, as well as too often policing, uh, too frequently does harm. Um, and people come out of being incarcerated worse than when they came in. And so um, I believe we can actually draw a lot of lessons from both uh, education reform and, and, and looking at uh, uh, health care as well. Uh, but a lot of things we do in criminal justice, like uh, not assessing someone, not diagnosing someone's issues uh, at the beginning, where you certainly would in any medical practice or else you'd be guilty of malpractice. Um, in education, you may see that we measure schools' performance. We measure students' progress. We rate schools. We have accountability. It's not perfect, and there's various problems with that. But when is the last time you saw a prison held accountable for its results, whether those people that it returns to society are, in fact, uh, better than when they came in, and whether they've advanced any grade levels? You know, in Texas, we still struggle with the fact people come into our prisons at an average sixth grade reading level, and they leave at a seventh grade reading level. Many of them can't even read. So uh, we are, uh, in summary, we uh, were able, in Texas in 2007, to turn the corner and stop building prisons instead of a projected 17,000 uh, prison bed construction, we in fact have closed three prisons and more than half a dozen juvenile lockups. And that led to starting right on crime uh, in 2010, where we've taken this uh, set of reforms to states across the country. Um, and it's truly amazing how many states have gone through the justice reinvestment process, two thirds of states now, where they've, instead of building more uh, prisons, they've invested more in alternatives to incarceration and treatment. And those states have actually seen crime decline even more than the national average. So we're now growing into policing uh, work as well, looking at things like civil asset forfeiture, um, as well as more transparency and accountability in policing and uh, rolling back police militarization. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Mark. I just wanted to mention since Mark has been deeply involved in prisons and that's not going to be our subject matter so much, that if you did not see 60 Minutes last week, you might watch, there was a fascinating episode on the German prison system, and to watch it is to see a completely different vision of what prisons look like than anything going on in the United States. And I saw Mark on camera, we watched the 60 Minutes episode last night, and I said to my wife, that's who I was having dinner with just a little bit ago. So it's really worth watching. So I want to shift the discussion to my left, and I mean that spatially and not ideologically. Uh, you might uh, need it may be that may, yeah. Maybe that as well. Uh, uh, and I want to start to ask the question, which we should take a few moments on, which is, you, you know, my rough agenda is, can we specify what people think are the issues with policing today? Can we think about what reforms might look like? And then I also think it would be fascinating to talk a little bit about political promise, about the ability to actually effectuate those reforms. So I'm going to start at my far left with Brittany and ask her if she wants to give us a sketch of what she sees as kind of the leading issues about policing today. All right, thanks for, uh, for having me. Um, so because I spend most of my days either working with, spending direct time with, or talking about children, it is impossible for me to separate um, these kinds of policy conversations from the human element. Um, mostly because the kind of policing that um, the students in St. Louis, um, who we serve 20,000 of them, all of them are low income, nearly all of them are children of color, African American, first generation American, um, where they most readily and usually first experience um, really aggressive policing is again inside of schools, right? Um, it is the school resource officer or multiple uniformed officers that are present at basketball games and homecoming dances and all of the places where when I was going to school because um, I was, depending on how you look at it, privileged to go to predominantly white private institutions, um, there was never that experience, right? Um, and so I, I tend to approach these conversations both from that policy standpoint, but also very clearly examining the human element of this because what young people internalize very quickly are two things and I've discovered this in particular over the last year and a half, but really over my almost 10 years in education, it's two things. One is to be absolutely scared of law enforcement. Right after Mike Brown, um, one of our teachers had one of her students and his two cousins in our office doing some work and hanging out. And so I had the two of them come into my office, gave them some snacks, and we were talking. And I asked the youngest one, what do you do when you see a police officer? And he said, run. He's five years old, right? 
Um, so very quickly internalizing these messages. And incidentally, when they left our office, they were walking with their teacher, who is white. Um, and a police officer started to approach them, and the youngest one started to actually hide behind their teacher um, and say, you know, the police are coming, you need to protect me, right? So one is this fear of a uniformed authority figure. The other one, though, is this internalized sense of submission or compliance that is actually really dangerous for children, right? You are all here at this fine institution because someone taught you to dream big, to imagine what's possible, to see yourself going out there and doing it and changing the world. One of the things that oppression does most quickly is actually limit your imagination and limit this idea that you can color outside the lines and stretch outside of the box, right? So, you know, ta Coates in his book, talks about schooling toward compliance and schooling toward being inside the lines and being inside the box at all times, and that particularly being a racialized thing because it happens most readily to black and brown poor kids in our country. Um, and when you see a police officer every single day in your school, that is going to reinforce that idea that you need to walk in a straight line, that you need to um, sit and stand when told to, that you never need to call out or be creative, eerily that makes a lot of our schools actually feel more like prisons than they do schools. And if any of you have spent the kind of time in schools, any kind of time in schools, some of you might have noticed some of the same elements. So I have to start from that very, um, from that human perspective, and we see that those two challenges extend in our communities into adulthood. So we use the phrase police violence on purpose because we actually want to expand this beyond just kind of brutality. Brutality often individualizes this thing and doesn't recognize the ways in which this entire system is very violent to our communities. And so when you have a situation like the one we did in Ferguson, which is about 15 minutes from where I live, the kind of violence that we had been seeing from police was not new to us. And if you read the DOJ report, you can see just how not new it was to all of us. Um, it says something that it took a DOJ report for us to finally believe people of color, but that's another topic for another day. Um, but so, you know, w that was not new to us. And yet when Mike Brown was killed, the first thing that people knew is that they had to constantly scream out in order to get any kind of semblance of answers whatsoever, right? So again, looking at the ways in which this entire sy system is problematic. So people knew they were gonna get lied to, and even if they screamed to the top of their lungs, which we did every single night, we knew we were gonna get lied to, and we did in a lot of circumstances, then you move from there into the response to our mostly peaceful demonstrations and protests. We were being full American citizens, but of course we were treated um, like enemy combatants in our own community, and so there's that additional element. And then you move forward to the potential prosecution of Darren Wilson, which of course we know did not happen because Darren Wilson ultimately was not charged. And he was not charged in part by a prosecutor who had vast conflicts of interest, not only with um, with um, this particular officer and department, but with the system of policing in St. Louis more broadly. So when people talk about this distrust between law enforcement and communities, um, it is very deep, it is very real, and it has more to do um, with just, it has to do with more than just a single police officer, a single act, right? People are experiencing these entire systems throughout their lives every single day when they get pulled over for a traffic ticket or when someone ends up dead in the street. And so for, for us, and I'll close with this, for, for us, us meaning myself, the team at Campaign Zero, lots of the activists that we work with, this is about systemic changes. Um, this is about not letting people get off the hook with saying, well, one bad apple spoils the bunch, but recognizing that systems perpetuate bad actions um, and ensuring that we actually shift those. And it's about making sure that we bring change to people's daily lives, which is why Campaign Zero is a 10-point policy platform. And journalists love to ask, well, which one do you think is the priority? Which one has to be done? And our point is you have to do all 10 of these things. It's not just about body cameras. It's not just about um, training. It's not just about any, any single element that actually all of these things need to work in combination with each other to empower people and to ensure that those people that derive their power from us, any public servant, but especially someone who's licensed to carry a gun in our community, that they consistently have to answer to us. Good, thank you. So I'm gonna to turn to Wesley in a moment. I'm actually keeping a list, and I'm gonna read the list as I've kept it uh, so far, and then I am gonna shift the conversation from diagnosis to change and systemic change. 
Uh, so far, I think that what has been identified as things we should be thinking about are asset forfeiture, uh, over militarization or militarization at all, uh, what uh, Brittany called uh, a problem or a pattern of lies and what Mark referred to as transparency, but I think the two are related and I want to talk a little about what transparency yeah. and accountability mean in the policing context because we hear that a lot and often it's not specified. Concerns about police violence, clearly racial issues, and then as a result of all that, uh, a sense of distrust of the police, which I will at least editorialize for one moment, my only editorialization so far, which is uh, I certainly come at this from the perspective, and maybe uh, the panelists disagree or agree, which is um, to the extent that distrust or a failure of legitimacy is a result, the current state of affairs is problematic simply because you can't run a society that way. I mean, policing is a function that we mostly need in society, but it has to happen in a way that people view it as legitimate and trust it so that we can uh, live peacefully and that alone therefore is maybe a, um, a result of some of the police actions that people have mentioned but uh, whether or not you know you agree with the causes to the extent that's true it's a problem we all have to address. Wesley is there anything you want to sort of add to the list? Well of course I mean I don't know that I would add to the list in some ways you know when I think about framing this conversation I think in broad buckets of of two things, training and transparency, right? And, and, and that's not to, because I think that all, many of the other kind of rabbit holes we go down fall within those two buckets. And so when I think about something like training, I go to the fundamental question of what is the purpose of law enforcement in our civilized society? Um, there's this conversation, this debate happening within law enforcement now, are, there, are they warriors or are they guardians? And, and, and that speaks to you know how your training officers are instilling values into police officers, into thousands of police officers each year, that, that matriculates in these daily interactions, right? It, what is the role of an officer? Is it, is it to guard and safeguard society and safeguard life? Or is it to be an armed warrior surveilling the streets, right? And I, and I think that there's an ideological divide there within policing very often. And I, and I think that that is one of the fundamental questions that we grapple with here as we talk about broader policing reform. Uh, what was interesting earlier, what Mark mentioned, you know, we had a broad conversation about criminal justice reform in the country. Like, that's something that we talk about a lot. Um, policing reform is a, like, a specific subsidiary of that that very often gets lumped into this broad criminal justice reform conversation. And, but in some ways, that kind of minimalizes the, the depth of conversation we have to have about policing in and of itself, right? And I think that what's unique about this moment that we're in, comp um, for the first time in decades, that we're having a real policing reform conversation in addition to an ongoing criminal justice reform conversation that we've been having now for, you know, you, you guys have been doing work for what? M well, more than a decade, right? And so I think that that, I th so I think that speaks to it. I think it, that speaks to that as well. When you're talking about training, it's this question of in any circumstance, um, are the officers there escalating the situation or de-escalating the situation, right? Are, are they what we know from, you know, my colleagues and I at the Washington Post did a project this last year where we've tracked all of the fatal police shootings in the nation. Um, we know that a quarter of the people fatally shot by police are either um, in the midst of a mental health crisis or explicitly suicidal. Um, we also know that many of those cases, what we also know is that the way police officers are often trained to interact with someone who is armed with a gun or a knife is the exact opposite as to how they should react to someone who is having a mental breakdown with potentially a gun or a knife, right? And so officers are very often trained to exert authority, to speak loudly, to raise their voices, to issue commands, right? But if someone's having a psychotic breakdown, that's in fact the last thing you should do is yell at them and get in their face and be loud and point guns at them. That is in fact a recipe for disaster, um, which we've seen hundreds of times in just one year. Um, what we also, and we, when we talk about training, we also in some ways have to train ourselves in terms of how we should analyze as a society law enforcement in any given use of force incident, right? So much of our conversation is often prefaced or premised around this idea of, is this quote unquote legally justified? Mm -hmm. But what we have to understand that we live in a society where based on the social contract we've bought into um, and um, until, you know, Brittany gets better at doing her job and, and changing the whole system, right? Until Damn. that, in, in, <laughs> I mean, step it up, right? But, but, until, but until that, <laughs> we, we go back, right? <laughs> but, it, it, until, until that happens, we live in a society where where police officers do not get charged for crimes when they kill people. Like that is a premise that, that again, like having an academic conversation, we have to accept. We have opted into that social construct, right? 
So that, what that means though, when we have a conversation about police violence, we cannot preface that conversation around this idea of was this thing quote unquote legally justified. The conversation has to mature to the point where we're not talking about was this officer legally justified, but should this person be dead, right? Because there are many things that are legal that still should not happen or could not, could not have happened had we done something different or had we prepared differently. We understand and accept that police officers are placed in difficult positions. That's in fact their job, it's what they sign up for, right? But how can we make it so that they are placed in the least number of those positions and that they are the best equipped in those positions to make the decisions that lead to the fewest number of dead people? Because I think that we can all agree that we would like fewer dead people, um, at least fewer dead people being executed in the streets by the government, right? By police officers. That's training. Transparency is the, the other like, crucial part of that though, right? One of the things that people were talking, we forget now because Ferguson's so long ago, but we went a week, um, we went a full week not knowing Darren Wilson's name. Um, mm -hmm. That was the cries in the streets were what, are his, what is his name, what is his name, what is his name. When Michael Brown was killed in the street, the police never put out a narrative of what happened. They said there's a dead body, there was an altercation, shots were fired. Well, a community has a right to ask its public servants, why did you kill this 18 year old? Why are we looking at his body? And, and I think that we're, we come to a moment in policing where departments are hopefully starting to realize that you can't kill someone in the street and then not explain to people why the body is there. Um, and, and that does not, and what we also know is that you know police officers very often, departments very often put out narratives about the bank robbery down the street, about the person who shot an officer last night, without any concern that this might compromise an investigation or, or, or spoil a jury pool. They often throw evidence and information out there. However, when a police officer is, uh, commits an act of violence, it's often treated very differently. Uh, we just did a story that ran on the front page on Sunday where we reviewed the 990 police shootings that occurred in the nation last year. And in more than 260 of those cases, the police officer who killed someone has never been named publicly, and the department refuses to release their name. Um, now, th there's a, there, in some of those cases, in about a dozen other cases, two dozens of those cases, the departments argue that they have a credible, specific threat to that officer. But even if you take that at face value, without even litigating that conversation, that leaves more than 180 police officers last year, um, extensions of the government, who killed someone um, using on, on taxpayer t time, using a taxpayer gun and taxpayer bullets, killed the taxpayer, and the rest of the taxpayers have no right to know, according to these departments, who that person is. Now, how can they even begin to have a conversation about whether or not this is a bad apple cough, whether there's a systemic issue, whether there's, if they don't, if they can't secure the information about whether, what this officer's name was. And so we have to frame any conversation about transparency at that most basic level, that in hundreds of cases, you have police officers killing people whose names are never released publicly. So then when we start jumping into a conversation about body cameras or anything, anything else, that layers on top of that, that adds layers of transparency, layers of conversation that we have to keep having. Good, thank you. So first two plugs. Uh, Wesley mentioned training and there is, um, and then he also talked about warriors versus guardians. So. Sue Rar is a former sheriff of Kings County, Washington, who runs the training facility, uh, and she was on the 21st Century Task Force with Brittany uh, at, in Washington State, and she's actually the author of this idea about, about um, guardians versus warriors and has a wonderful training program called Blue Courage, and I, I commend it to you as something interesting. The other is, uh, because Wesley brought so directly up the issue of force, I should put a plug in on Friday all day, and you said you'll be in town all week, so you're I more will. than welcome. Uh, the Center on the Administration for Criminal Law is running a one-day symposium on the use of force and use of force investigations with a stunning lineup of law enforcement and civil rights uh, enforcers and just the whole group. Um, so I want to turn... I, sorry, yeah, can please. I add one issue yeah. that got skipped over in this conversation, part, partly because it was my fault, but also it's <laughs> reflective of the broader conversation, um, is that we absolutely have to talk about the... the um, the role the collective bargaining plays in all of this. And it's a challenge for me to talk about because as a former teacher, I was a member of the Washington Teachers Union, right? Like my father was a member uh, of, um, of his union, I mean my grandfather rather, um, as an auto worker. Uh, and I um, often, because I get work for Teach for America, get accused of being like a union buster, which I'm just not. Um, and yet, 
Um, I have to point out, and we've done this in Campaign Zero, it's actually our 10th point, we've done a whole report on it at checkthepolice.org, um, about the ways in which police union contracts are used to subvert justice. Like, there is no other way to put it. Um, and when you look closely at it, it goes way beyond due process. Um, we're talking about contracts that allow for officers to have a 10-day waiting period before they're allowed to be interrogated when they've killed someone in the line of duty. Um, we're talking about um, a collective bargaining agreements that totally block any form of civilian oversight, let alone civilian oversight with subpoena power or real teeth. Um, and so that is one of the ways, it was interesting when you mentioned the 21st Century Task Force, that's what made me remember it, because um, so we in January, right at the, the top of the year, um, the entire task force, we went back to DC and we had an implementation conversation. And so we had a conversation amongst ourselves and then we met with the heads of all of the major national police unions, the Sheriff Association, the FOP, I mean everybody. And we're gonna keep it real here. So we sit across the table from them and they're like feeling really proud of themselves for doing presentations about the 21st Century Task Force Report. And I'm like, great, anybody can put together a PowerPoint. Are you doing anything differently? And the response to that, and I asked this question as did a former chief of police from Atlanta who's on the task force. He said, you know, uh, he, he asked this question of what's being done differently and their response was, well, everything's too expensive, right? That most of the changes that you've outlined will just cost us too much. So I pulled up checkthepolice.org and I pulled up the four ways in which we believe that police union contracts specifically can be changed um, to, to start to change this tide, which are all free because they're all part of a collective bargaining agreement. And you would have thought that I asked for them to figure out a way to get us to Pluto the way that they looked at me like I had two heads, right? And so that is an issue that often gets swept under the rug when we talk about um, issues of policing and they prefer it that way, right? We had to actually FOIA request these police union contracts. They're not online, right? They're not, when we talk about transparency, they're not transparent. And so it is very easy for this particular conversation to not include issues of collective bargaining and police union contracts, but they absolutely have to. So I want to ask about transparency and accountability. I'm going to, you know, I listen to the, the folks up here talk and it's a rush of words and it's sort of um, a metaphor for where the country's been on this set of issues, you know, since Ferguson and everybody I know in the policing space on the activist side, on the law enforcement side, everybody's kind of running around very, very busy because there's been so much attention to it. We have folks in the, in the audience who I know are busy with these issues. Uh, and so I understand the rush of words, but I'm gonna urge crispness uh, in, the, in the interest of how much we can talk about. But I wanna start with Mark and I wanna ask the question, you know, so what do you, you know, what do you, in your website, you talk about accountability and transparency being conservative values. And so when it comes to policing, and I should also just say one of, you know, in, in really matching up with what Brittany just said, which is that one of the things that Right on Crime's done is shown how you can save money in the criminal justice system and then redirect those funds in other ways. And I do think, you know, training is a key part of this. Training is expensive to do it well, uh, to do it through simulations, and, and coming up with that funding is, is a, a, a terrifically important thing. But I kind of want to ask, what, you know, so what do transparency and accountability mean in the policing space to you? Well, I think it certainly means that the public should have a clear window on what uh, policing practices are. And um, part of that, you know, when you think about it, Barry and I were talking about, uh, you know, you've made, I think, this great analogy to the EPA or other agencies that have rulemaking and they have to post their rules and take comments from the public. And, you know, you've done this through your project in Camden and other places, which, but it's really revolutionary, the idea that, uh, because currently a lot of police departments, whatever policies they have in many cases are unwritten, but there certainly was no, if they are written, there was no opportunity for the public to weigh in on those. Um, so I think that uh, when you look at things like body cameras or use of force, certainly use of military style equipment to the extent that, that we're gonna do that, these things all need to be constrained by clear policies. And maybe in some areas there does need to be some discretion for officers, but that ought to be spelled out. Um, and you know, I was also struck, one of the first things you brought up was the issue issue of children, you know, uh, and in our schools, we need to make sure those officers have training for dealing with kids. And also they need to know when 
they should not, uh, just because a principal says they should uh, arrest a child, m maybe they shouldn't. And the problem is a lot of them are getting paid by the school, so they're not necessarily, they're compromised in some ways for the, in terms of their judgment. Now, we've had to pass laws in Texas saying that schools should no longer be able to give kids uh, criminal citations for minor student misbehavior, like chewing gum even, uh, which some schools were doing. Um, and, and so uh, we've uh, said that no longer is it the case that schools can criminalize any violation of their student code of conduct. Uh, but the research shows the early, the younger the child is when they have their first involvement in the criminal justice system, the more likely it is that they will go on to a life of crime and being incarcerated. Um, so um, undoubtedly, we need to make sure that, uh, that we don't um, kind of uh, pass the paddle, so to speak, from the school to police and courts and, and, and juvenile detention and so forth. And uh, we've actually seen in Texas, one of our juvenile probation departments, they sent a letter over to the school school district saying we're not taking any cases other than truancy anymore, uh, so don't send them over as far as any misbehavior in school. Uh, you go ahead and take care of that unless it's an assault, it's some offense in the penal code. Good, so, uh, and I thank Mark for the plug, certainly central to what the policing project is about is this idea of written policies and public weighing in on the policies, and so those are two classic and important aspects of transparency, though two aspects of transparency that have not always been prominent in policing. Anything that you, Wesley, would add to that? Of course, I mean, I, th I think that's extremely important. I think, one, transparency of policy. There are, um, as you go through in FOIA uh, police union contracts, collective bargaining agreements, as Brittany was talking about, there's, I always forget what department it is. There was a department that returned the FOIA, essentially redacted, it said, um, an officer may use lethal force under the following circumstances, and it was a black box. Everything Houston, had been redacted, I think, right? I think it was Houston. Yes, it was Houston, right? And, and so, so the people of Houston are not legally allowed to know when the cops are allowed to kill them, right? According to the police department. Now that that doesn't seem like the way that our form of democracy is supposed to work. Um, and, and if and again, if people are not allowed to know with the names of the officers who killed them or when the officer is allowed to kill them. How can we even begin to have a conversation about what we're doing with all these videos, right? I mean, in that, my colleague Kimberly Kindy did a piece last year where she looked at uh, the number of shootings last year in which that, that were captured on body camera. Um, there's been this big push, it's often kind of pushed out there as one of the solutions, and I, and I believe it probably is one of the things that helps create a level of transparency. But we also have to have a policy conversation about what that means. In most cases, in most of the shootings that were captured on body camera last year, the family of the person killed has in the public have never been allowed to see the video of the shooting. In almost every case, the police officer involved gets to watch the video before issuing his statement on why he killed the person. Right, and so here you again. Are t when we talk about two different systems, you know, I, if I, you know, if I were to kill Barry or Brittany up here, or maybe both of them, I certainly would not get ten days before I would get to be interrogated. I wouldn't get to have all five of my attorneys present, and I wouldn't get to watch the video feed of it first to come up with my reason for why I did it. Um, however, what we know is that when a police officer kills someone, they they are thrust into a system that is fundamentally different than the rest of us. It looks very different than the rest of us. And it's shielded from the type of transparency and accountability that the rest of us deal with in the legal system. And so, like I said, when I think about transparency, that's something I think about. And we also, I, I just think we have to shift our ideology away from this idea that any questioning of law enforcement or, or policing is somehow anti-police. And this is something that uh, permeated American society mm -hmm. prior to Ferguson. It's something that still has its enclaves and strongholds, right? Uh, I, when we wrote the piece last week about all these officers who weren't named, my inbox was full of calls and emails and tweets from people saying this is just anti-cop uh, propaganda, what are you doing, why would you get to know, you, you know, it, why are you focusing on, why are you focusing on the shootings, what about all the times when people aren't shooting, and, and what I respond to people is I say, look, I haven't read any any articles about all the emails Hillary Clinton sent properly, right? I haven't read, and, and if she killed someone, we'd certainly be talking about it. Uh, we wouldn't say, well, what about all the people she didn't kill? <laughs> police officers are an extension of the government. <laughs> if a single police officer last year killed a single person in a circumstance when maybe they shouldn't have, that is a major scandal and a major story that's the government killing someone. And we have to recalibrate our thinking about this, right? Because this is fundamental to our society and to our democracy and to our transparency. And again, I think we have to, uh, when we talk about police union contracts, one of the reasons so many of these things have been able to be backloaded into them is because there's no sunlight on the process, of the collective bargaining process. Mm -hmm. Some of that falls in the media, right? We, these are processes that are, to some extent, public. 
Um, however, in most cases, in most cities, if there's any media coverage of the new police union contract or the new firefighters contract, the coverage amounts to are they getting a raise or are they not getting a raise? Um, most of us have never read the police union contract for the for the police department that governs us, right? And so I think that that's something that how you said you brevity, Wesley. Oh, brevity. You know, I'm trying to hit all the points real quick. <laughs> I'm glad you're over there helping out. So, um, so I you know, I, just, I want to. Um, to express a pet peeve and then sort of toss the question to Brittany about accountability, which is I think that very often in the policing world, most of our focus goes on accountability after the fact when something has gone wrong, whether it's court appointed monitors of which there are some in the room or judicial review or uh, civilian review boards or inspectors general, now body cameras. And I like to think about accountability in a democracy very much on the front end, meaning Again, that we should have a clear understanding of what the rules and policies are, of why they're in place, have public input into that. Uh, but I don't know whether I'm missing then something from accountability. So Brittany, you get the last word on this before we talk politics. Yeah, I mean, well, it has to do with politics, right? Good. Because a lot of accountability on the front end um, has to do with who we elect and what we, the process through which we elect them um, and the uh, amount of scrutiny um, amount of scrutiny that they endure, but also the qu kinds of questions that we make them answer before they get elected, right? So I, you know, when, um, after Ferguson happened and everybody was doing the kind of, uh, unfortunately pun intended, like the post-mortem analysis of Ferguson, um, one of the things that people highlighted was the lack of diversity on the city council. At the time there was one African American city council member, right? So then everybody was like, well, you need black people on the city council. Hold on, <laughs> wait a minute. I have a whole lot of questions for anybody who's going to be on this city council, right? Um, regardless of what your color is. So case in point, we fast forward to about a month and a half ago when the Ferguson City Council is voting on the consent decree from the Department of Justice. Now, this is the federal government and Ferguson, Missouri. One of the new black members of the Ferguson City Council was someone who essentially tried to subvert um, this particular consent decree by saying we will accept the consent decree with the following seven amendments. Well, you don't get to amend the consent decree after you've negotiated it, right? You've already spent thousands upon thousands of taxpayer dollars in Ferguson on your hiring lawyers to negotiate this particular contract. And now, because you want to appease the status quo, you want to change the game, of which, in effect, obviously, renders it useless, which is why Loretta Lynch, thankfully, got on TV the next day and was like, okay, if this is how you want to play it, then we'll just sue you, right? Now... When we were talking about electing people, it was just about representative diversity and not about actually holding people accountable to promising certain things to the people from which they derive their power. And I use that phrase a lot because as a teacher, the people that I derive my power from are my students and, and their parents, right? Those are the people entrusting their children to me every single day. And so if you had a complaint about me, it was not my job to say, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about because you're not a teacher. No, actually, I owe you this, right? I need to listen to and adapt my practice according to what you're talking about. The same is true for any public servant. And when we talk about um, issues of policing, right, they are beholden to mayors and city councils and the folks who, and state legislatures, the folks who set these policies. Um, and so that when we are not holding a level of accountability and transparency on the front end, it makes things even harder on the back end. Last case in point, Last, actually last week when we were in Philadelphia talking about ALI, I'm like on my phone for pretty much the entire meeting because there was another police involved shooting of a, a we think unarmed uh, young man in St. Louis City this time, a kid named Anthony Randall. Um, and there are 87 different cameras in the area where he was killed, 87. And the St. Louis Municipal Police Department came out two days ago saying that there is literally no footage that shows us what actually happened. Now, when protesters got out there because they realized what was happening about two hours after the shooting happened, they did the smart thing that we've learned over now 19 months and got the eyewitness statement because Anthony Randall was in a car with someone else and there was someone in an auto body across the street who saw the entire thing. So we got the eyewitness statement because we knew 
we knew that if we didn't get it, whatever was going to come out from the police after the, the films had been reviewed and all of that kind of stuff was going to be totally different than what these people were telling us. And case in point, and, and to uh, be sure, both of those people's um, um, uh, recalled of the, the incident um, pretty much align and the story that the police chief told later that day in a press conference because now they know they have to give a story was completely different from it. And we've got no evidence of it because there are 87 cameras in the area and none of them got the footage, right? There are lots of things that could have been handled on the front end of that um, to require a different outcome. Oh, I'll just add quickly, one of the things I think also is that uh, I absolutely agree we need to hold officers accountable, uh, but I also think that we ask them to do too much, particularly in the fact that there's too many crimes. And of course, in Ferguson, uh, police were asked essentially to be revenue collectors. Um, with We saw the average of three warrants per household, mostly for minor traffic offenses, indeed one woman for an overgrown lawn. And so it caused an uh, excessive number of interactions and, uh, of course, bringing people to jail, which when you look at the cost-benefit analysis, and we're actually doing a project now on fines and fees with the Brennan Center here at NYU, but we believe, for example, once you look at the cost of actually trying to collect this money, getting blood from a turnip, uh, it's going to be, uh, in many cases, it's not even working as a revenue generator. But first and foremost, it is the wrong thing to do. We need to greatly reduce the number of, not only the number of things that are crimes, but also the number of things that are jailable, that are subject to arrest, rather than just um, you know, giving someone a notice or community service or restitution if they stole something and so forth. Um, but we have a seriously over-criminalized society, and I believe that is part of the problem. So I want to um, offer just one thought about a model of accountability, and then I want to express um, some sadness about something I'm hearing that maybe can pivot us to reform and move the conversation out into the audience. You know, the one thing we often, when we think about accountability, I mean, Brittany put the nail on the head, the model that we have in the United States, largely for historical accidents, going back to the progressive era, is that there's a mayor who appoints a police chief who then holds office at the, at the will of the mayor and, and makes then the decisions that need to be made. And when we think about accountability and having rules and principles up front, often we think about legislative accountability, but all of you know, because you take leg reg in your first year of law school, that there are other models of accountability, one of which is conceiving of the police, and I think we should as an agency, uh, that can, can and should make its own rules for itself, but do it publicly and do it with public input uh, so that we all understand what's happening. And that's a very different model than we ever think about with policing. Uh, but one we should. I listen to this conversation and I'm sad because uh, not only do things go wrong in the world, but frankly there is, as we all are well aware and as the President's task force documented at great length, an extraordinary amount of distrust uh, in police. And I, I don't think that's a tenable situation. I just don't think that we can expect law enforcement to do its job in that environment. Uh, and it's regrettable that we are where we are, but I'd rather be hopeful and look ahead and ask, so you know, how do we fix it? And we've heard some suggestions for reform. I think the Campaign Zero website's full of good ideas. I wanna, in a moment, open it up to the, to the floor for questions, but I guess I have kind of a, a different kind of political question I wanna ask, which is, as somebody said, I can't remember who, but people say it all the time, it might have been Mark, it's been a bit of a magic moment. I mean, we have the left and the right up here agreeing about some pretty fundamental things. The country's been focused on the issue, and I'm curious, you know, how long this moment lasts and how we can take advantage of this moment to actually try to reform things. Because I think, uh, though everyone won't agree about what's broken, there seems to be some consensus that there are problems and we ought to be able to take that idea and move forward with it in some constructive way. And I'm just curious, everybody gets 30 seconds, a minute, and I'm watching you. Uh, and then I want to take questions about, you know, is this moment extendable and, and what can we accomplish in it? Uh, so do you want to be first, or do you want to waive your right oh, to go I'm first? I'm going to waive my right to go first. Okay, well then, Mark, you get it. You actually are spending a lot of time effecting legislative change, so you're a good person to ask. Yeah, and of course, it's an interesting question to ask if there's a difference between the correction side of it and the policing side. Um, and certainly the paths meet in many ways because um, part of the whole thing with policing is you tend to find what you're looking for. I remember many years ago there was a program in Texas where police officers were actually trying to find parolees, uh, you know, uh, violating some technical rule of their parole, which really should be the job of the parole officer, although thankfully now I think we're doing more in terms of parole officers helping people succeed rather than trail them, jail them, and nail them, which was an old sign in a parole office in California. But uh, so I do think there's... Uh, Certainly, um, the idea, 
I think that we're hopefully we're getting away from is measuring police performance by how many arrests you make, measuring prosecutors' performance by how many convictions you make, how many years on average you get as a sentence. But there are some prosecutors' offices where, you know, at least as a few years ago, those were still uh, performance measures. Um, so, um, you know, William, I, I forget, it was George Kelling actually who said, you know, the idea of a system should summon the human body an equilibrium, a natural balance between the parts, whereas with a criminal justice system such as it is, um, actually, um, you know, if, if, you, if you think of, if you're measuring, uh, too often you're measuring the wrong things because you're focusing on volume, that you're rewarding police for making more arrests or rewarding uh, prosecutors for putting more people in prison when that's not really uh, the, the, what you're looking for. So um, I do think that um, because there are so many uh, reasons uh, for uh, both on the right and the left why this is important, um, as long as long as kind of people don't get distracted by kind of tangential issues or don't think just because someone who I don't normally agree with on most things is agreeing with me on this that therefore I, maybe I'm you know uh, I shouldn't be doing this. So th that that's the biggest threat because we are in a very pol pol uh, polarized political environment and indeed there's been research showing members of Congress now vote more differently based on party than ever before. Um, there's research on cognition showing that uh, members of the public um, if the mess, if the same policy comes from uh, a leader in one party, which they subscribe to, versus another, they'll react far differently. Um, so we need trusted messengers on both sides of this uh, ideological spectrum to continue to uh, move this issue forward. So I hear Mark saying two things. First is we need to change the metrics that define policing and success in policing, and I think there's a lot of agreement about that, even in the law enforcement world, and yet it's difficult to develop those metrics and work is needed. And the other is, you know, Mark puts his finger on an interesting point, which is that, you know, often you try to figure out your own position by looking with, at who agrees with it or disagrees with it, and polarization is a risk in this area. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to go now, or should I go to Brittany? Well, I guess I'm ready to go. I'll let, Br <laughs> I'll let Brittany have the last word. I'll keep it brief for her benefit. Um, the, uh, look, I, I, think, I think that what we need to do moving forward is easier said than done, right? I think that we need to, we need to police based on, we need, we need to, we need to police in ways that are smart uh, and that are based on uh, data analysis um, and common sense, not based on anecdote and emotion. Um, for a long time, we've increased patrols because there was a bad murder or a bad rape, even if statistically there was never going to be another murder or rape in this town or in this city because murder and rape is scary and that need, means we need more cops and we need more, right? We, we need to evolve to the point where we're policing in a way that is smart and not wildly reacting in one way or the other to the tabloid crime of the day, right? Um, we also need to, um, uh, and, and I think that speaks to what is the fundamental role of policing in our society. Um, frankly, when we talk about distrust, and this comes up not enough in these conversations, we need to solve more murders. In the United States of America, we only solve six in 10 murders, right? And in places, and in places where you have high concentrations of them, you solve many fewer. Uh, you want to know why many young people or, or many specifically people of color don't trust law enforcement is because they feel as if they're receiving a high volume or high quantity of interactions with police for low-level things. They feel like they're being harassed on the street corners or, or stopped, questioned, and frisked. But then when their mother or their uncle or their brother is shot and killed, the greatest crime that could be committed against another human, those murders go unsolved, right? And, and so they're receiving a lot of policing, but not very good policing. And I think that that is something mm -hmm. that, that, spe that speaks to one of our fundamental breakdowns in currently in American policing. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight two points there, one which Mark also raised, which is that we as a society ought to be thinking about the level of criminalization because that then breeds policing and we've over-criminalized and therefore over-policed. And the second that I hear you mentioning and we hear a lot of conversation about is data-driven policing, that we yep. need to police in a more smart way. Brittany, you are going to have the last word before we go to questions. Yeah, you know, um, that last point was good, Wesley. You like, you showed up today. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about it. I knew I had to impress you with that last. Um, uh, you know, Ferguson brings people together in weird ways. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a slightly different approach, just given the benefit of this audience, right? And I look at you and know that you are going to be not just, you know, defenders and prosecutors, but judges and chiefs of staff and legislative councils and working at DOJ. And the, the, thing, that we, the thing that I think um, gives me hope and that I will make an appeal to you to do um, is to show up. Right? And I know that that sounds really broad and vast. I'll tell you what I mean. I mean it specifically in two ways, right? I like to wear messages on my shirt. This one says, stay woke. 
Um, and it's, it's because, A, showing up in a way that um, gives you the kind of proximity and access to what's happening to the most affected every single day is critical so that it informs your work, right? I think that Brian Stevenson is an incredible example of how that is possible in a, in a legal profession. Um, and I learned a lot of that from him from afar and also up close on the, the task force um, in the work that I do every day, right? Because it's really, really easy to go to great institutions like this and sit in beautiful rooms like this and actually forget how the things that we are doing affect people every day. Um, and forget that because we are sitting in these kinds of rooms, we have the privilege to actually go and change that. But you're not going to be oriented toward changing that in the ways that actually people need you to do it if you're not remaining close to what's happening on the ground, which will require you to pay attention to race. It will require you to pay attention to class. It will require you to pay attention to, to oppression. Those things aren't comfortable, but you got to stay woke anyway. The second way to show up um, is, is to then bring that truth that you come to understand into the system. You know, I got asked over the weekend why in the world Campaign Zero activists met, met or talked to Martin O'Malley's staff when he was still in the running for president because she's from Baltimore and she's very frustrated by the kind of leadership that he showed in Baltimore. And there are 150,000 people that can trace their incarceration to when he was um, running that city. And I said, I feel you, I get it. It's really easy to wanna say, you know, I have nothing to say to you. But we talked to him because he was running for president, right? Because I can't let you into that office without being accountable to the issues that affect me and my community. And so I, there is a place for us to um, push from the outside, but it is also critical in, that we simultaneously play that inside game, and you have the ability to do that, right? Not just when you leave school, but when you're here right now. Um, and so, like, my appeal, right, and the, the place where I put hope is those of us who are not only going to push from the outside, but take that truth that we receive from that level of proximity to the most affected and bring it, force it into the system, um, and make sure that we're changing things from the inside as well. So I'm not going to summarize that because you were quite eloquent. Uh, Brian, if he were here, would be uh, agreeing with every bit of it, I think. So I'm late to the microphones, unlike me uh, in this role, but there was so much to be said here. But who's got a question? Let us know who you are. Hi, I'm Nani, and I'm wondering how, all three, for all three of you, how you could include police officers in this conversation, and if you think they have a space in this conversation, because I was almost hearing you say that we should almost be going above them to the city council, to the mayors, and to other people. I'm gonna ask, I'm actually gonna keep people tight or not hear from everyone so we can get some more questions, but who wants to jump on that? I'll go really quickly, because I have, probably more relationships with law enforcement now than I ever imagined that I would because I sat on the task force and the Ferguson Commission. Um, absolutely, there is a place, right? I mean, there is a, I shouldn't talk about changes to the legal profession if I'm not gonna go talk to some lawyers, right? I mean, it's what you're saying makes common sense. Um, I think though that there is a certain um, requirement of mindset that people have to enter that conversation with. Um, you know, getting to know people like Suror and, and you know, to listen to uh, Chuck Ramsey talk about the mistakes that he made when he ran the DC Police Department made a difference for how he approached that conversation, right? So if you are not coming in with a willingness to change and be changed, then it's like not a conversation we can wait on you to have. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think definitely getting feedback from officers and uh, particularly having a way uh, for officers to provide feedback, perhaps unanimously, I mean, uh, not unanimously, anonymously, if they are concerned. <laughs> Both would be great. <laughs> yeah, but we want them to have some mechanism to speak up if they don't agree with uh, things without feeling like they're going to be uh, suffer reprisals, um, I would think. And then, you know, we've actually found a lot of common cause with sheriffs in Texas um, because many of them, almost all of them, in fact, were patrol officers before being elected. And then when they get in, they realize the jail is a huge headache, a source of litigation, and they're particularly uh, strong on the issue of diverting people with mental illness from jail, um, as well as reentry, because they're frustrated seeing the same people uh, come back. Um, so uh, they can be allies, certainly, in uh, kind of uh, expanding alternatives to incarceration. Other questions? Oh. Hi, good afternoon, Jean-Luc. Um, this question is specifically for Brittany. Um, so you just spoke about you know, being proximate and um, 
from my experience or what I've realized is people in Black Lives Matter movement um, have been doing a lot of organizing um, when it comes to getting you know input from the community and whatnot. But you know, as your as part of your task at, of the task force, what has been your experience? You know, when people don't really I mean, if it wasn't for Obama, a lot of people wouldn't have even heard of the word organizing in the, um, right now in those circles. So what has been your experience when you're in those circles in these fancy rooms and people don't think that organizing is legitimate and that talking about race, you know, that we live in this post-racial society now, um, what has been your, your experience in those spaces with those battles, I guess, and points of views? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I took a lot of grief for joining the task force because people were like, oh, here goes your sellout moment, right? Um, and I get it, right? Like, political theater is real. Um, but my thing was, like, the task force is going to happen anyway, and so you don't get to have that conversation, and you certainly don't get to make decisions without us being in the conversation, right? It can be me or somebody else, but I'm a firm believer that if you're not at the table, you're on the table, and I just like refuse to be on the table, right? And so I think that is often how I approach those spaces, recognizing that sometimes those of us who sit in those spaces carry unnecessary, undue, heavier burden to be really relentless about these conversations. But I get in there and I tell a lot of stories, right? I, because I believe that lived experience is just as critical data, right, as, as the statistical stuff we read in a DOJ report. Um, so I get in there and I tell a lot of stories and I will not let the conversation not be about race. And I'm going to build a relationship with you so that you know that I'm like, not just here to talk crazy, but that I'm actually like trying to bring something to this space. And I have seen people shift, right? Not because I'm so spectacular, but because there's a relentlessness that a lot of us in this movement have around um, refusing to let the conversation go left, which is again why I say like showing up in the space is really critical. And when one of us shows up and we make room for two of us and we make room for four of us and we make room for 12 of us until the point that like we're at all of the tables and we're building the table ourselves and inviting other people to come to our tables instead of the reverse. Thanks for the question. Other questions? Sure, hi, um, my name is Audrey, I'm a 1L here, and I wanted to talk about um, TFA and kind of outside educational organizations. Ooh, Chad, I got policing. all the questions today. <laughs> What's up? So uh, I grew up in Sunnyside, Houston. The man on the end might kind of know what that means, uh, but for everybody I else know Sunnyside. here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a really bad neighborhood in Houston. There's a lot of uh, crime, a lot of school to prison pipeline issues. But uh, one of the things that really helped me a lot as a kid was I got to talk to my teachers. Um, and my teachers, a lot of them were from the same community, so they knew what it was like to grow up poor for my classmates of color. Um, we had a lot of teachers of color who could kind of relate to them on those issues. Um, but when my friends and family who still are in the area told me that TFA was coming into a lot of the Houston schools, I was actually really concerned uh, because that teacher connection with the community seems to be going mm -hmm. because there's a lot of uh, teachers cycling out. A lot of the teachers are more privileged. A lot of them are coming from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. So I'm wondering if you, see TFA as taking away um, that link to the communities where they can talk about issues mm -hmm. like policing, mm -hmm. issues like, uh, you know, do I run when I see a police mm -hmm. officer or do I stay? Yeah. Um, so I'm well, gonna you've been put on the spot on every subject here. <laughs> it's all good. Let's do it. Um, no, I appreciate the question, right? And I appreciate the opportunity to address these things because those concepts do exist. Um, and, and I recognize that it's coming from a, a really real place, right? It's coming from people's experiences with, um, with our program. Um, here's what I will say, um, is that a lot of, and I'm not necessarily saying this about the, the folks that you're attesting to, um, but in my general experience, a lot of these kinds of perceptions are based on who we once were and not who we are now. I can tell you who we are now. Um, we are an organization that for the last two years, nationally we have brought in a 50% core of people of color um, and nearly that much people from low income backgrounds because we have made an explicit priority around recruiting, uh, selecting and training people who reflect the, the financial or the economic and racial backgrounds of our students. In St. Louis, it's about 40% for that number. Um, we've also um, placed a huge priority around recruiting people that have ties to our community. So nearly 40% of our teachers in 
in St. Louis, have ties to St. Louis, they either grew up there, um, or uh, we have a, an increasing number of second career professionals, so more people who aren't coming straight out of college, but who have been working as teacher's assistants, disciplinary folks in schools, running after school programs and saying, I want to be a full-time teacher and coming into our program. You know, I, sp I know Sunny Side because I spent time over there. And I spent time over there because um, our CEO, uh, who's a Latina woman, lives in Houston. Um, she's, she taught in the Rio Grande Valley, which is her hometown. Um, but she now lives in Houston where she is raising um, boys who are half black and half Latino, right? So this is very, very real to her. And I spent time with our Houston core and her as they were being inducted about four years ago. And we went over to, a group of us went over to Sunnyside because we were invited by members of the community there, including our CEO's former chief of staff, who's not only a resident of Sunnyside, but a parent of Kids and Teach for America classrooms, a black woman, uh, Candace. Um, and we had this, this exact conversation, right, about like, who are you, what are you doing here, and what are your intentions with our children, right? And we heard from parents and children about the hopes and dreams that they had for themselves and for their families and for their futures. Um, and that is work that we do fundamentally differently now than we used to do it. Um, we're, we're, we're not, we're very intentional about not engaging in cultural tourism, but rather engaging in what we call culturally responsive pedagogy, which is not our idea, right? It was created by an education scholar named Gloria Ladson Billings, but I will say in St. Louis and across the nation at Teach for America have employed culturally responsive teaching not as an initiative, but as the way that we teach, right? CRT is basically a concept that says, you have to place academic rigor, cultural confidence, and cultural consciousness next to each other in the classroom, otherwise your classroom is not up to the bar. That is the standard by which we train our teachers in St. Louis and across the country. Um, it has left, I will close by saying, it is not necessarily popular, right? So being a protester who's also the executive director of Teach for America St. Louis has lost me a bunch of money. It has lost me a lot of friends. There are lots of cocktail parties I don't get invited to, that my team doesn't get invited to, et cetera, um, because we're thought to be activists or anti-police or anti-white or whatever. No, 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 I'm pro-child and I'm pro the children that are in our classrooms and we can't claim to stand up for them inside of the classroom and not care for what happens to them outside of the classroom. So at the end of the day, I am thankful that I work for an organization who's been willing to stand up for what was right, because I'll tell you, if I worked for anybody else, I'm convinced I would have been fired by now. <laughs> so I want to, um, what's our, we go till, what's our, till two? Oh, good. So yeah, then let's, before this question comes, I just want to say one thing, uh, in, in, not in response to what Brittany said, I think we probably agree about this, but I do want to point it out, which is, I don't think you can have these conversations without law enforcement in the room because then you're just talking to yourself. Um, people do have to come being willing to speak with one another. One thing that worries me a lot as I move in these circles now is I've become convinced that often law enforcement is just speaking a different language than many people who are upset with law enforcement. And one of the things we need to do is actually manage to bridge that gap so that people can manage to communicate. Uh, but question. Hi there, um, my name is Blythe, and um, I want to bring the international into this room. So how much of this conversation is an international conversation? Uh, three examples come to mind. Of course, there has been huge connections, Ferguson to Palestine. There has been Amnesty USA has done Rio to the states and looking at the, the comparisons, especially from a race-based perspective. Um, but we also know that police chiefs went to Scotland, which is a force that is entirely de-armed, um, with the exception of very specific units that are called in for moments. And in that conversation, they were saying, could, could we uh, have a less armed police force here? Um, so I just want to see what your guys' thoughts are and, and how much is this a global conversation and pulling on the militarization as well, knowing that that is a, an international issue. Anybody, anybody want to say about the subject? Well, no, I think it's a, a, a really interesting uh, uh, idea to focus on comparative policing as we did with comparative corrections and the trip to Germany because it really was enlightening. Uh, we saw inmates being able to scan their own books that they were checking out from the library, making choices during the day, and they're expected to show up for work at a certain time, and they got paid, you know, 16 euros a day to assemble, to build and assemble bumpers for, for cars. Um, but there was a much more personal responsibility and autonomy uh, for these individuals in prison than there would be in the United States. Um, and so indeed they had a commitment to a, what I would call a parallel universe model, that indeed the prison should look as much as possible like ordinary society so individuals are prepared to resume life when they uh, come
come back out. Um, and certainly in policing, I mean, of course, as we know, there's differences in societies in terms of, for example, guns being much more prevalent in mm -hmm. places in the United States um, as far as the people that police are encountering. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think that uh, it, it makes all the sense in the world to look at uh, what policing practices in other countries we can learn from. Um, and uh, going back to what you said earlier, Wesley, I mean, de-escalate rather than escalate. I mean, we had the Sandra Bland case in Texas where the officer said, I'm going to light you up. Um, and it was clear, as it was in that New Mexico case where there was that African-American woman who was uh, visiting New Mexico with her children, that, yes, you could go back and watch the video and say she should have done X, Y, and Z differently. But what we need to focus on is the government uh, accountability. And even though uh, I would say that officers whether you're nice or a little unpleasant when you're pulled over, you should get the exact same treatment from that officer. That should be our goal. Now, they're human. We know that. But I think one of the things you have to look at is the research showing there's a, uh, if an officer has a macho complex, which they've actually measured in certain ways, if they feel threatened uh, by authority and things like that, then they have a much more um, kind of belligerent response to the individual they're dealing with. And so some people, you know, we need to psychologically screen people who are going to be officers. You know, they may be wonderful people, perfect for other occupations, but not everybody's cut out to be a police officer. Just a word about Scotland, because the, and, and, and again, what's going to happen here Friday. So the Police Executive Research Forum went to Scotland, and that, the, fun, the result of that was that they've issued what's called the PERF 30, a set of use of force guidelines that have become very contentious among the FOP and the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And in fact, they had a big meeting to try to iron out their differences yesterday. But so there are definitely lessons to be gained from other places. Do we have other, yep, we still got questions. Good. Lots of questions. Hi, my name is Emily Jacobs. I'm actually a student in the School of Social Work. Um, so I guess my perspective from, at this conversation is a little bit different. And I was just wondering if there's been any conversation about integrating people from other professions, like for example, social work into policing. We see that in um, the criminal justice system, in the court system. You see like mm -hmm. examples like the Center for Court Innovation has the Red Hook Community Justice Center and they have social workers in the court who work with offenders, make recommendations to the judge. And there's that communication, and I think in a way, that's also the boots on the ground perspective that you can bring into the police department because social workers are working with the communities that are served by police. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering if that's at all part of the conversation, integrating other people aside from just law enforcement officers into police departments to sort of de-escalate those situations. Yeah, I think that I think there's certainly been conversation about this broadly. And I think it's something that's certainly on the wish list of most people who spend a lot of time looking at issues of policing reform. I go back to this often because it's one of the things I've done the most reporting on. The issue of mental illness and the interactions between people suffering from mental illness um, and police officers is monumental, right? If, if, I mean, that's 250, 300, almost 400 people killed last year by po American police officers who had someone, had it been not someone with a gun responding, but rather had been a social worker or someone specifically trained in this, might have prevented that person from being killed, right? Um, but I also think that one of the primary challenges is here, because we can, we could, we could sit down for 10 minutes and we could probably figure out a few really good suggestions for how this could work differently, right? What there, people have suggested, should there be a completely different number that you call um, if it's someone in the midst of like a mental health crisis? Should there be some type of response, you know? But what makes this complicated is that, and what makes any level of policing reform complicated is the system of government in which we exist, right? We, policing is a local small government issue, right? You've got the sheriff, no one is the boss of the sheriff, the sheriff's the boss of the sheriff, right? No one is the boss of the police chief, maybe the mayor is, maybe the council is, theoretically, right? Policing is not something that is federalized here. It's not something that big government really has its hands on in many tangible ways. And so even as we identify best practices, even as PERF identifies them or the International Association of Police Chiefs does, even if the union is bought into it, there is nothing that can tell Sheriff Joe to do anything different than what Sheriff Joe wants to do, right? And, and that becomes deeply complicated. So even when you have, for example, New York's actually a good example of this. New York used to be extremely, extremely bad when it came to dealing with people in the midst of crisis. And now they're held out as one of the gold standards um, of having a specialized team that, that can come in and deal with, with these situations, right? But, but no one can force Philadelphia to learn New York's lessons. No one can force LA or the LA County Sheriff's Department to learn LAPD's lessons. 
And so because of that, you know, again, there are 18,000 police departments in the United States of America. 17,000 of them could get it right, and I would argue that not even close to that number is getting it right. But even if 17,000 of them got it right, you'd still have 1,000 police departments out there with, with representing tens of thousands of officers with the license to kill you. <laughs> perhaps not doing it the right way. And so, like I said, I mean, I th there's been a lot of conversation about that. What's much more difficult is not identifying the best practice, but figuring out how the hell in the United States of America could we get the police to do them. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we're really interested in is um, there's a program in actually Lubbock, Texas, where uh, this guy runs a mediation center and they do criminal mediation. So the officer, and he gets referrals for both officers and prosecutors, but the officer can say, look, you really need to, uh, why don't you go to mediation on this instead of arresting someone or, or processing it through uh, the court system. And uh, it's had great results. And um, so that's an example of kind of bring that. And the other thing is it's just a huge waste of money. You know, we looked at some cities, how many calls policemen were sent out over barking dog complaints. You wouldn't believe it, but it's a huge waste of resources as well to be sending out someone with a pretty big salary, a big pension, a lot of training to deal with, you know, more serious things. Um, so uh, there's so much that, that I think could be done there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the mediation one, it's kind of a funny story, but one of the cases they got, this was kind of funny, that this grand, one grandmother uh, was cut off another one going into the ATM, and uh, so she kept she got so mad, the woman that was cut off, she kept backing her Cadillac into the other woman and damaging her vehicle. And so the DA called, this isn't the current DA there, but the former DA called and said, I got two good Republican grandmas that need to come over to your mediation clinic. You know, so, but it does give an off-ramp. I mean, we need to build more off-ramps uh, in the justice system from the traditional process. And indeed, many of those can involve no one having a conviction on their record, the victim getting restitution, community service, and so forth. Um, and we can greatly reduce the number of arrests as well as the number amount of time that uh, police, uh, appointed counsel, prosecutors spend on matters that they really don't need to be handling. So, uh I feel like we're stopping a conversation in media res, uh, but the clock says we have to do it. Uh, folks will linger here for just a little bit, but you've been terrific, and thank you for coming. <laughs>